Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Anton. I'm the co-founder of Chroma. Um, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about you know, using retrieval um, and vector em embeddings for uh, use with large language models. Uh, it's a pretty interesting topic, and it's gained a lot of steam in the last few months. Um, and I'd sort of like to talk about the basics, but as well as the sort of the challenges and the advanced work that needs to be done in NLP and other domains to really make this sort of approach um, with using retrieval for LLMs much more robust and actually practically useful. So let's get into it. So let's talk about the basic idea. Um, the basic idea is essentially that you have some programmable memory store. Uh, Chroma is sort of building memory for AI that you can send to query um, to, and relevant information will be retrieved, will be passed to the large language model along with the query. And then together with the knowledge that the model is already trained on, the model will be able to synthesize uh, an answer to that query. Um, the basic way that this works, and I guess most of you who are familiar with NLP will be very familiar with this approach, is you have an embedding model which takes data in the form of text, but also images and video, and turns it into a vector embedding, uh, which is a you know dense uh, floating point representation of that data. And you can think about each embedding essentially as a point on a map of meaning in that sense that each embeddings that have similar semantic content wind up um, close to each other. Embeddings that have um, very different semantic content end up in other places um, spatially, essentially. Um, you know, and typically embedding models are very high dimensional, um, uh, but the geometric properties uh, of the vector spaces that these models produce allow us to do things like similarity-based retrieval in vector space. So to putting this together, you basically have a vector store or um, an embedding store like Chroma. Uh, you have your query, you take your documents, your previous data set, you embed it with Chroma and store it. Uh, and then you take your query, um, pass it through to the embedding model. We retrieve um, the most relevant results according to the nearest neighbors um, of the query vector and resend both the query uh, and the most relevant results to the uh, large language model in order for the model to produce an answer. This is very easy to do uh, with Chroma. You can try it out at our website at trychroma.com. Uh, it's just a few lines of Python. It's very easy to integrate into any sort of um, LLM-based system where you'd like to add retrieval. And one of the things that we really aim to be is really easy to use. But there's actually a lot more to making this work than just nearest neighbor vector search. Um, of course, it is important to get the architecture of the retrieval system itself right to make sure that it's scalable, especially sort of horizontally, so that you can support many collections and many users um, and provide good retrieval speed and good retrieval accuracy. But from another perspective, there's a lot of other components that actually really need to work. So most users, once they have a production version of such a system stood up, are asking questions like these, which is, which embedding model should I be using in the first place? Because obviously, Different embedding model providers and the open source community tend to make claims regarding how effective their model is, but there are very few effective benchmarks around what will work in a particular use case, and there's very few good ways to evaluate it right now. Uh, they'll ask things like, how do I chunk up my data in order to make sure relevant results are actually retrieved? And then how do I actually determine whether a retrieved result is actually relevant? And many of you will recognize that these are actually, some of these are classic problems in information retrieval applied in a new context and used in a new way. And some of these are actually entirely new problems, which we haven't really faced before um, in the NLP and, and sort of machine learning community. So let's let's get into these in a little bit more depth. So the bad news is uh, there aren't concrete, clear answers to these problems. But the good news is that these are really important problems that are now affecting a very wide class of people building with AI. Uh, and that means there are a lot more people working on these problems than there were before. And there's a lot more data available as well to work on these problems. So let's start with the first question. Which embedding model should we actually be using? We have you know, the classic existing benchmarks around retrieval, you know, things like BIR and MTEB. Um, which are fine, except that these data sets are somewhat synthetic. They don't necessarily reflect the real usage of retrieval in AI applications. And so the real question is not which benchmarks should we use? The real question is how do we create appropriate benchmarks for users of retrieval systems in an AI context? And there's increasingly, you know, it's increasingly possible to do that. Many of the existing benchmarks actually provide the open source tooling uh, around them that 
that was used to build the benchmarks and create the evals in the first place. And those can be adapted to particular use cases. Uh, and we do recommend that users actually start benchmarking their, with their own data using human feedback uh, on relevance, um, allowing them to construct their own data set, perform evaluations, but also importantly in the future to perhaps fine tune their own embedding models and, and get more performance out of their uh, retrieval systems in their AI application. So the next question is how to chunk. Um, chunking, of course, is important for a couple of reasons. The first one is um, embedding models have a limited context window. There's only so many tokens that you can feed them. Um, similarly, large language models only have a certain size context window, although that has been increasing lately. But there's other pieces to this too. Um, the sort of the way that you chunk your data determines the semantic content of the retrieve results. And if you sort of have very wide chunks, then you have you very much are at risk of including a lot of irrelevant information um, with each retrieve result, which is something that's well known to degrade the performance of um, of the overall AI application, as the as the large language models tend to get confused easily by distractors. Um, so we can try by chunking on natural semantic boundaries, um, on semantic boundaries, or we can try to, to sort of like preserve the natural structure of the text. There's a few tools that allow us to do that. NLTK and, and, and Langchain definitely include um, useful chunking features. There are a lot of experimental ideas in this though that I actually, uh, we're actually very interested in exploring. And if, if you're, you as a researcher are interested in these directions, we would love to speak with you. Um, we can use the model's perplexity at the next predicted token compared to the actual next token um, to find semantic boundaries. So we might be able to use a lightweight language model completely in the loop with our chunking process to achieve that. We might be able to use information hierarchies where we use sort of increasingly specific summaries of the text uh, in order to find the relevant pieces of information among our entire corpus. Of course, there are trade-offs there because we're imposing a hierarchy that's kind of hand engineered uh, to some extent when this is something that the model really should understand on its own. And another really interesting approach that we've been considering is looking at basically the continuity of embeddings and basically applying a um, sliding window um, over text and sort of embedding the text as the sliding window slides across the text and then looking for discontinuities in the embeddings um, produced that way. And you know we can apply ideas from time series methods and filtering to find those discontinuities and use those as our chunking boundaries. And those are interesting ideas also to try in, in audio and video as well, not just text. So finally, Unlike traditional databases, uh, something that you're using as um, memory for AI, this sort of this sort of semantic retrieval-based approach, you need to be able to give a signal about how relevant you expect the result to be. And I'll give a very concrete example of this. Imagine you've taken all the English language Wikipedia pages about fish, uh, and you've embedded them and stored them in a vector in a vector store, and you have a user qu query come in, uh, and it's about birds. Now you can obviously you will ask for the n nearest neighbors, and you'll be guaranteed to return those n nearest neighbors. But in the case that I've just illustrated, none of those nearest neighbors are actually relevant to the query or the task at hand. And the developer currently has no way of really understanding or knowing that. So what is it that we can do? Um, the classic approach from NLP and information retrieval is applying a secondary re-ranking model that, implies, that uses additional signals besides the vector retrieval to sort of rank the relevance of the results. We can use feedback um, on relevance to sort of improve um, the actual relevance of the returned results in the first place. Uh, and we can use things like augmented retrieval using keyword-based search uh, and metadata filtering to sort of do hybrid search. But the real sort of opportunity here is to have an algorithmic approach to relevance that is also adaptable per user and per task, um, which will allow us to actually give that signal back to the developer to say, listen, uh, among the results we've returned, we don't actually expect many of these to be relevant to the query. Um, they're quite far apart or they're quite uh, they don't appear to be the results that we're getting don't appear to be semantically relevant. So these are uh, these are interesting questions that really need to be answered. So yeah, as I mentioned, um, we are Chroma. We are building the memory stack for AI. We're building programmable memory for AI, and these are research questions that we are deeply interested in, above and beyond uh, building the right vector search infrastructure and building the right horizontally scalable solution to power AI applications at, at large scales. Um, we are interested in speaking with you if you're performing research in this, in these or adjacent topics. Um, yeah, thank you for listening to the keynote. I think that it's a very exciting time to be working in this space. I think it's also a very accessible time to be working in this space, and we'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference.